Welcome to another episode of Inspire People Impact Lives. Today we're rocking and rolling with special guest Joel Plant, CEO of Frank Productions and The Sylvie, Madison's new music venue. And I would say favorite. I think Thank we got to go with favorite now as well. I'll go with that. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Well, I want to, so I told you beforehand, I don't necessarily always read people's bios, but I find yours particularly interesting with how, or who you are today or the role you play today with what your uh, background has been. So tell the audience, Joel is a seasoned background in leadership. He was a managing director with KPMG. And for those that don't know KPMG, a top four accounting and consulting firm worldwide, and served with the Milwaukee Police Department as chief of staff. After that, correct? Before that. Oh, it was before that, okay. And then uh, worked as deputy mayor under Mayor Cheslevich, if I pronounced that correct. That's correct, yeah. Yes. Nailed it. Practice that one, because I remember Mayor Dave. Everyone just called him Mayor Dave that's because right. they couldn't pronounce his last name. So so that's great. And here in Madison. So now with CEO as a, for a Frame Productions and the Sylvie, we today picked the title or a topic, I should say, a Myths of le- Leadership. So we'll have a few that we'll toss back and forth and have some dialogue or dialogue around that. And today we also have off camera Renee Frank. Renee has told us you have a very interesting backstory and you've been an incredible mentor to her, which is a huge compliment. I feel like anytime anyone can say that they have a mentor in someone and that you're a mentor to someone is a, is a great compliment. So before we dig in on today's topic, why don't you tell us a little bit about that backstory? Sure. Well, I appreciate it very much, Josh, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I do have a very, uh, I think, uh, interesting, uh, nonlinear background. And when I when I talk to students in in college classes or graduate school classes or law classes, I tell them, look, you need to have a recipe. You need to know exactly where you want to go. You need to start hunting for it right now because it's going to be a line, a straight line. And then I draw my career trajectory on the whiteboard or whatever's there, and everyone looks confused. And then I get a good chuckle out of them and say, don't fool yourself into thinking that you know where you're going to end up in 5, 15, 25 years. Um, when I was in, in uh, graduate school in Arizona, I found myself working for the Tempe Police Department, and I found myself uh, doing analytic work for them. And then I decided to go to law school, and I knew I'd leave law school and go be a good corporate lawyer and, and work my way up through a, a law firm. And then I ended up uh, as a baby prosecutor in Outagamie County for a minute and a half. And <laughs> then Mayor Cheslevich called me and said, you know, you might, might consider coming down here and joining our team. So we moved back down to Madison real quick. And that was all logical. I think I was 26 or 27 when that happened. And then I got an opportunity to go work for Ed Flynn in Milwaukee as his chief of staff, which was a brand new, unique civilian position in a very large, major city police department, which again followed the linear trajectory to becoming the CEO of, of Frank Productions. <laughs> um, when I was uh, with the police department, I started doing some consulting work on the side. And as anyone who's listening, who's worked in government knows, um, Everybody in a senior leadership position in government consults. Everybody. Everybody takes vacation time and moonlights as best as they can to help supplement their income and get more exposure and experience. Um, So I was doing that and then got excoriated for it by the Common Council in Milwaukee, certain members of the Common Council in Milwaukee. Um, But in the meantime, I got the attention of a a partner at KPMG who who added me to his team and uh, I began, began consulting across North America on, on all sorts of issues regarding public-private partnerships, uh, organizational development, leadership development, analytics, all the fun things of organizational growth. And then Larry and Fred Frank called me. And I met Larry and Fred back in 2005 when we had our very first Freak Fest. And uh, for those of them have been around know that that was a real black eye on the city. It turned mm-hmm. into this, this kind of uh, uh, little little self-formed riot. Yeah, I was going to say it turned into a mini riot essentially in those years. And we knew how to respond from a policing perspective, but I was naive enough to think we could probably attack it from a different angle and create some structure and and not make it a police problem. And so we did it, and it worked, and I was as surprised as almost anybody. Um, (laughs) And then I went and met with Larry and Fred because I knew we couldn't do it two years in a row, and I needed somebody who knew concerts and crowd control, and, and that's the Franks. Frank Productions. So I met with them. We did a lot of work together. They began helping us with Freak Fest. I wrote the original contract that I now negotiate on the other side for Frank Productions on an annual basis with the city, but I think it's 12 or 13 years running now that they've been involved. So that's why I met Larry and Fred and immediately knew these are these are two guys who run a family-owned business that was started by their mom and dad. What a neat story. What an unusual story. 
and the story gets gets more and more unusual every day that that would move forward unusual and positive so then in uh would have been may i believe of 2016 i was in i was at a client somewhere with kpmg and larry and fred called and said hey we've got a we've got a idea and you might be crazy enough to do it <laughs> and uh, so we had a couple of conversations. How about that for an opener? Yeah, that was that was essentially what the conversation was. Um, and I immediately knew this was a great idea. It was unscripted. It was untested. It was with a family-owned company, which has its perils, as, as everyone um, yeah. in business knows. But it also has some real incredible uh, synergies and a real incredible strengths. And so I came on board in January of 17, and we immediately opened up the throttle and started merging with entities like Matt Girding and Scott Leslie at Majestic, and we purchased the High Noon Saloon from Kathy Detmers. We broke ground on the Sylvie. We immediately began pursuing partnerships across the country, and we've grown rough numbers in terms of headcount. We've grown 400% in, in two and a half years, and revenue to match, and we've uh, really put ourselves on the map, not just as a concert promoter nationwide, which the company has been since 1964, but now as a venue operator and tour promoter as well. Yeah. And, that, and for anyone that hasn't been to the venue for either an event or a concert, it's phenomenal. You got to get down. So that'll be my promotion for you Very guys good. today. Thank you. I, yes. I believe it is the best venue now in Madison and really unique experience. We appreciate that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really special. So I think you started with one of the myths, and we didn't even have this on our pre-show yeah. list, but the one you talk about in on campus, the straight line that a lot of young uh, either adults or young entrepreneurs think they're going to follow with right. whatever degree they choose. Any anything you add to that uh, discussion there? Yeah, I think I think we we like to convince ourselves, whether it's in high school or college or, or in our early twenties, that there's got to be a path to get where I want. And one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was at that point in my life, and I resisted the advice. I hated it. I thought this guy's all wet. Uh, it was from a, a friend of uh, a friend of mine who was uh, quite a bit more senior and had a lot more experience than me. And he said, stop figuring out what the path is to get where you want to go. Figure out where you want to go and go do it. There will be a path, but stop worrying about what the path is. Worry about what the goal is. And I find that if you look at, at your life in, in increments of less than five years, you're much more likely to get aggressive about taking steps. Make decisions on 18-month bases, not five-year or 10-year bases, because it's a whole lot more manageable to talk about the next year, year and a half, and to conceive of yourself a year and a half older versus 10 years older. Right? Right. I look back at the last decade, and I can't, I can't believe what, what I've done, where I am, and that I'm still standing, <laughs> right, to be, to be real honest. So that's the context I would give folks is, is certainly have a 10 and 15 and 20 year perspective on your life, but attack it in 12 and 18 and 24 month bites. Yeah. So you could buy, right size those goals and break it into chunks. Yeah. See as far out as you possibly can break it into chunks is kind of what I heard there. Right. Absolutely. So I, I also think about like society and how we uh, go about uh, telling young adults to get into a career. It's, it's kind of, I don't, know, I don't know if it's warped, but it's certainly interesting in how we go about it. So we're telling 17, 18 year old kids to go pick a major right. that's going to lead them to a career and they're supposed to decide what that career is supposed to be by the end of four years right, or five years, or if you're Van Wilder, seven or eight Maybe years. Maybe seven, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but either way, like they got to just make that decision. That's supposed to be the right decision. It's right. kind of a fallacy. It's, I think it's a largely a complete fallacy. I mean, there are people that knew from a very, very early age what they wanted to do as a profession, as a career to give to give back to society. And, and congratulations and kudos. Most people can't conceive of that, right? And so you go in and you get a general degree, or I mean, my degrees are in, in history and criminology. And when I graduated, I remember very specifically my dad on my graduation day saying, hey, very marketable degrees you got there, son. Like, <laughs> well done, right? And I, I didn't think anything of it, but he was right. What am I going to do with that? Am I going to go out as a brand new graduate and and land a management job with a criminology and history degree? What do you have to do? You have to go work. You've got to go hustle. You've got to go screw up. You've got to do it in environments that cultivate that and allow it, and and set those expectations for you from a, from the very start. Yeah, that's really good advice. The one of the things I just want to touch on before we move on there is when I used to speak to campuses a lot, I would give the advice to actually figure out job duties mm -hmm. or 
roles that you could see her in, see yourself in and spend your time doing, then try and find job titles that match up to that. Versus I think what a lot of students do is try and think of a job title right. that sounds sexy or sounds good or whatever it might be or fits the description of the degree they got and they end up getting into that job and absolutely hating their life. Realizing that this has nothing to do with what they're passionate about or what they're interested in or what they're even good at. Right. I would take it even further and say, not only figure out what you like and 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 then back yourself into a p- potential position or opportunity based on what you like doing and what you're good at doing, but affirmatively rule out the things you don't like doing. Yeah, And if there's great. too much of that in a job, whether it's on a piece of paper or being discussed with a potential employer or partner or whomever, don't do it, right? I think I can count on more than a couple of hands the opportunities that I thought, well, I, I could do that. I could do that. But then you have to stop yourself and think, but should I do that? Right. Is that the right fit for me? Just because I could doesn't mean I should, right? And being really objective with yourself about those those truths yeah. is, is important because we've all been in a position that we thought would work or might make sense and found out that doesn't make any sense at all. And now I've got myself in a real stick. That's, that's great advice. Last thing on that, because it just came to mind as you said that, was there, there's also a fallacy that you're going to like everything about your job. Yeah. Even to this day, and I, and I love what I do, and this was my second stop. I was a sales manager at Best Buy before I became an advisor at Northwestern Mutual and now a managing partner. But I, I, I say I love, I love 80% of my job. Sure. There's, there's 20% that I dislike, and sometimes very much. And so, but I, there's not many people, I don't think, that can say they really love 80% of the work they do. So also keep in mind that there's probably going to be a portion of that job, even if it's your dream job, that you dislike. I completely agree. And I think the 80-20 perspective is valuable there. If you, if you like 80% of what you're doing on a day-to-day basis, congratulations, right? And recognize that that. It's work for a reason. There's going to be challenging pieces. And the, the key to me is, if you, even if you don't like those pieces of the work, if they're important to get done, then you're the one to do them. Yep. Right? And those might be the pieces that are a little bit distasteful or a little bit uncomfortable or a little bit tedious. Those are the ones that have to happen so that you can have the opportunity to enjoy that 80%. Yep. Agreed. So, all right. Well, the first leadership myth that we discussed was leadership is about making decisions. Right. I, I'll start by saying... All these myths, all these notions, I am completely guilty of buying into all the time. I have to continually remind myself that these are, are not truisms. Um, and there's all kinds of platitudes out there and books and memes and things you can see and people you can listen to that, that address all this stuff, and, and it's all valuable. I, I enjoy consuming it. I enjoy talking about it. I enjoy brainstorming with folks um, on a constant basis, applying it is the trick Mm -hmm. and having an opportunity to apply it is the real magic right you can have all these thoughts in the world but if you're not in an environment that allows you and expects you to experiment and try and learn then it's going to be really challenging to do much with this besides know it so that's my my preface to all of this um so so you're saying you're not perfect i'm as far from it as humanly possible (laughs) that's good and And everyone needs to know that is because every time i interview someone that's highly successful is I, I want the audience to know is that we're all flawed and we're all still on this continuing journey of personal growth. So it's great segue or, or opening for you. Sure. No, I, I my point, and, and Renee's heard me say all this stuff, so I apologize in advance. But um, when we're talking about adding a team member, when, when I was talking to Larry and Fred about having me come on board, uh, they asked, well, what, what are the characteristics that are most important here? I said, well, you gotta, you gotta be curious. You've gotta be self-aware. You've got to have a sense of humor. Even be able to laugh at yourself sometimes. Um, you've got to have reasonably good judgment, right? But the most important one of all those is that you're curious and willing to learn. You're coachable. Because everybody, everybody has things they can improve upon. And the key to me in terms of organizing and uh, uh, developing a, a team is having people be comfortable with those kinds of conversations at every level of the organization so that, so that there is... Uh, an expectation that we're going to give each other candid feedback. There's an expectation that I'm going to be held accountable by my team. And there's an expectation that I'm going to speak up when I see something that doesn't look right. So those are those are kind of the foundational points of, of um, I think, an entrance into an organization or being part of a team, let alone leading a team, is you've got to have that, that curiosity and that willingness to coach and be coached at every I mean, organization. I couldn't agree more. And what you really spoke to there broadly, or I should say, 
more narrowly, I'm going to speak to it broadly as an organization set of core values. Yeah. Yeah. And so you just basically stated yours. I don't know if they're listed like that, but you seem like you talk about them a lot. Sure. So knowing an organization's core values and when you're assessing whether or not to join that organization, do they at least match most of yours? Sure. I think um, uh, I, I completely ignored your first question, which we'll get back to, which was, <laughs> we'll which get was decision to. making. But um, the foundation of it all is, is what, are we, what are we here to do as a team? I don't care what kind of team you're on, a football team, a rugby team, a, a sales team. I don't care. What are we here to do? And then how are we going to behave while we're doing it? And what are we fundamentally committed to as an organization? So we came in, I came into Frank Productions, and, and I wrote the mission statement. The mission statement I wrote based on what I saw. I didn't come up with a whole cloth like, well, we're going to do this instead. I wrote what I saw and the history I understood from, at the time, 53 years of the company iterating and evolving and winning. And what I saw was connecting artists with fans and helping them have fun since 1964. Right, tight, fun. Who gets? To, who, who can't get behind selling a good time and putting on an entertaining, uh, fun experience for both the artists and the fans? That's incredible, and it's such a, a counterweight to most of my career, which was dealing with the the harder side of humanity, mm-hmm. where there wasn't a lot of joy, and we were dealing with the aftermath of that. Um, so this is a real positive sea change for me. So that's our mission statement. Our core values are very easy, and they relate directly to our intolerable behaviors, right? The core values are respect, integrity, teamwork, and quality. In that order, we're going to be respectful to each other. We're going to be honest with each other. We're going to be focused on building our value as a team and working as a team, which is a collection of teammates. And we're going to be focused on quality for our customers. So our intolerables are you're disrespectful. You are dishonest, you lack integrity, you refuse to behave as a team member, and you refuse to focus on quality. And I add one more for good measure, you refuse to learn. If you repeatedly exhibit any collection of those behaviors, you've got to go, period. And the other side of the intolerables that I remind people of is it's not just about a person who might be exhibiting those behaviors. An intolerable is also something, a behavior that you see in an organization or a team that if it's not addressed, you'll quit because somebody yeah. else is behaving in a way that doesn't match up to the company's values. It's unimpeachable stuff, right? Lay it out, explain it, hold people accountable to it. The key is you actually have to, you have to live this mission and the, and the values and the intolerables. If you do that, you're gonna develop a very strong, very cohesive team, which sometimes means people leave. And sometimes means people leave under duress and sometimes means people leave on their own volition. And a commitment that I've made, I make vocally to the team almost uh, every month I make this commitment to the team globally and I make it routinely on a smaller basis. My commitment to you is to help you find the things in life that make you happy and passionate and developed. And that might be here, it might not be here. If you're not happy here, I will do everything I can to help you find the thing that makes you happy and that allows you to grow the way you want to grow. And, and I have not had anyone take me up on that here. I have had it in other organizations. But the key isn't make things work here. The key is make things work for the individual. Right. And the environment that we've created at Frank Productions is that environment uh, for, for most of our team, but it might not be for everybody. And that's perfectly acceptable, and there's no, there's a, uh, there's no animosity around that fact. And I, I love how clear you are about those things and are able to articulate them very clearly. And then I always like the phrase, inspect what you expect. Yeah. Uh, that's that follow-up on that, the communication that you put out there. Right. All right, so getting back to our first myth. Yes. Leadership is about making decisions. Yes. Um, I, I, I suffer from this idea that if I'm not making decisions that I, I'm not being valuable. And when I'm in my right headspace, I realize my job is to make zero decisions. Um, and I'm only making a decision when the rest of the organizational structure is broken down. So uh, what I really enjoy is helping people get to a decision when they feel like they might need some guidance or a little prodding. And I do that based on curiosity, which blends us into another one of these myths. But I think a, a, a good leader, the leaders that, I, that I've worked for and worked with that I most respect, shoot, they never made a decision. When I look <laughs> back at it, I might have felt like they were making all the decisions or it might have appeared that they were. But at the end of the day, they were helping people on their team make decisions and making sure that they were equipped and had the resources and had the information they needed to make good decisions. Not perfect decisions, but good decisions. So I continually talk about, you know, if you bring me an issue, I'm, in, I'm instinctively going to try to solve it. And I'm instinctively going to try to make a decision in order to solve it. And I want my team to challenge me not to do that. 
Don't solve my problem for me. Help me solve the problem. And I really enjoy that. That's where I feel like I'm really the grease in the machine at Frank Productions, where I can, I can, because I'm not an expert in many of the things that are going on. I'm never going to buy a tour. I'm never going to market a show. If I'm doing those things, a company has fallen apart. So I'm going to make sure that I'm never doing those things. I'm never going to sell tickets to a show. Um, but I've got teams of experts that are doing that and have been doing that for a long time. And my job is to get the barriers out of their way for them to be more successful. How do you eliminate barriers to let your people shine? I think that is the biggest, one of the biggest obstacles any business owner or leader sure. has. You got to know what the what the problem is. You got to know what the barrier is. And I think one of the one of the fallacies of problem solving is that it's easy to identify accurately identify a problem. It's easy to point at something and say that's not working well. It's really hard to say, okay, what is it specifically that's not working? Why is that a barrier? How do we resolve that barrier? Those are the, the discrete pieces of problem solving that take something besides instinctive thought. And we all are wired to say, that looks like a problem, let's address it. Shoot, that didn't work. Well, we failed, yeah. okay? And by no means am I saying that every problem solving exercise is going to be perfect. Are you making incremental progress? Are you addressing the pieces that you can best control? So how do you, how do you remove barriers? You, you force people to think more critically about what they're complaining about in the organization. This isn't working well, and it must be because he's not doing that, or it must be because she's not paying attention to this, or it must be because our software package is a pile of junk, or it must be because of this, or we don't have these resources. Some of those criticisms may be generically true, but until you discreetly define what the problem is that you're trying to resolve, and then, most importantly, get the right people in the room to help solve it, ask your team for help, until you do those things, you are, you're getting lucky with your problem solving. And you're, yeah. and you're actually taking your organization sideways in terms of its ability to evolve and iterate and rely on itself. Wow, that's really, really, really good. So let's, that actually kind of even leads us into our next that you spoke on as leaders, leaders are experts in their field. Yeah, yeah. So describe that myth. Sure. Or why it's a myth. I think there's a lot of organizations um, where people are exceptional operators. And so we naturally say, well, they're, they're incredibly good at that discipline within the organization. Let's give them more responsibility and let them oversee the function of that, that piece of the company. And maybe that works or doesn't work. And we say, boy, they could take on more responsibility. Everyone likes them. Everyone respects them. And at a certain point in every leader's career trajectory, you are way out of your wheelhouse in terms of your technical, technical expertise. What are you blocking and tackling good at is leading no longer the substance of the, of the actual right. organization, right? Some, some football coaches never played. Many of them never played. Well, how can that be? As it turns out, you don't need to be the perfect player to be the good leader. And that's a, a myth that I think a lot of organizations struggle with because it's, it's almost illogical at, the, at a base level that, that in order to, to lead a team of engineers, you must be an engineer. In order to lead a team of uh, baseball players, you must have been a baseball player. Or perhaps you let the baseball playing and the engineering continue on with the expertise, and you, instead as the leader, focus on the structure and the removal of barriers and the setting and managing of expectations and the performance standards of the team as a non-expert. And I've seen it in every, every avenue of my career. When I was in, in policing, I was, I was the odd man out. I was the new kid. And how could I possibly know anything about anything, right? Because you didn't have, quote, stamps in your book. You didn't have time on the job. There's some, there's some truth to that in terms of tactical uh, proficiency, but in terms of organizational development and, and pushing a, a team forward, it's a non-factor. You, um, you get into government when I was you know, in my mid to late 20s, working in a mayor's office, which was an incredible experience. Um, people would rightly look at me and say, why are we even entertaining this kid? Why, why are we even listening to him? He doesn't know the first thing about public works. He doesn't know the first thing about forestry or whatever the case might be. I was asking questions, and I was, I was being as inquisitive as I could for me to learn myself, but also to help the organization learn and better address, identify, and solve problems. Um, in Frank Productions, we have it. We've got a team of presidents who are some of the best in their field in the country, hands down. And what they, what they haven't had exposure to until relatively recently is this broader sense of organizational management, 
They've been the down and in operators of the company. They are the experts. And we very quickly, on my very first day, we set this tone that I will never come in and tell you how to do your job. That is, will not ever happen. If you feel like it is happening, you are obligated to punch me in the head. Okay? <laughs> it simply is, is not figuratively, of course. It's simply not going to happen. And I think if they were sitting here, they'd tell you it's never happened. I ask a lot of questions so that I can learn, but not so that I can help them make decisions. So I think uh, finding somebody who, who fits your culture and your ethos and who you think you can have a have a really robust, sometimes loud, sometimes critical conversation with, uh, oftentimes loud and critical conversation with, is the key to bringing in a leader from the outside who is not a subject matter expert. And I think a lot of organizations understand that, but very few succeed at doing it because it's really hard to do. Yeah, and they, they feel some obligation to people within the firm maybe. Sure. Uh, I know in our, our field, and I think a lot of sales fields, they will lean towards whoever's the best salesman mm-hmm. deserves that next shot at being the next leader. And sometimes that works, but oftentimes, like you said, the football coach or baseball manager that never played can often be one of the best. Sure. Uh, so the same, same applications there as well is that just because you're great at sales does not mean you're going to be the greatest leader of that organization right. either. Right. So that's great, great feedback there. So, Next one, leaders are always projecting confidence. Sure. I, I think I'll speak for myself and not anyone else. I like to think that I'm projecting confidence all the time, but, but if I'm being honest and vulnerable, which is the counterweight to this, um, much of the time I'm uncertain about the direction I'm going. I'm uncertain about the answer to the questions. I'm uncertain about the likely outcomes of a decision. Um, and, and my obligation is to convey that uncertainty in a way that isn't um, disabling to the, to the organization. I want to arm the team with confidence that being vulnerable is not a sign of weakness, but it's actually a sign of transparency and it's an indicator of a leader on a team, of a team, who's willing to roll their sleeves up and say the most important answer to any question, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know the answer to that, right? Yeah. And that was a lesson I learned many, many, many times over, um, oftentimes when I would I would jump to a decision or jump to a conclusion in the effort to look confident, I was dead wrong. And it's a, it's a uh, truism that anytime I've ever said, effective immediately, anytime I've ever done that, it, usually in, in an angry response to a bad circumstance, I was 100% wrong. And I ended up having to go back and eat my words and change course and then look not only vulnerable but uh, humiliated by the fact that I made such a lousy decision. Hmm. So accepting the vulnerability and talking about the vulnerability um, is, is really crucial to, to a leader's ability to generate confidence from their team. Who am I trying to feel confident? I'd like to feel confident as an adult human being. I like to feel confident. I need my team to generally feel confident that I'm going the right direction. And I also, more importantly, need them to feel confident that they can come to me with anything at any time. And they're not going to get run out of town on it. But I love the two words you use there because we talked about confidence going first there, but confident and vulnerable. And I think that a lot of leaders, especially men, can't blend those two. Sure. Because they think that being vulnerable shows a lack of confidence. Sure. When in actuality, being vulnerable and those three powerful words you used, I don't know, are are actually the most confident thing you can do. Mm -hmm. And saying, I don't know, but... I know someone that does, and I'll get back to you within the next 24 hours. I teach my young advisors this all the time because you're coming into a business where you don't know all the answers, and you shouldn't try and make something up because it af- could affect someone negatively financially, right? Which could affect their life, and then you're fired, right? You know, so like the the best thing you can do is say, "I don't know," but I have a specialist at the office that does, and I'm going to find out for you and get back to you within 24 hours, and then you follow up within 24 hours. It breeds more trust and more confidence in you as a human being because you followed through. And again, I think we're in a society now where following through and, and uh, actually doing what you say you're going to do is kind of a lost art. Oh. So it breeds more and more confidence when you do that. Isn't it something that, that when somebody somebody follows up with you the way they say they will, you're surprised Yeah. right now, right? You, they yeah. actually call you back or get you the information they promised within the amount of time they promised. It's, it's an unusual circumstance now, which is really a sad a sad state of affairs um, that we we constantly grapple with, and by no means am I suggesting that I'm I'm perfect on that either. I, I fail on that routinely, 
And I find myself acknowledging that failure, not apologizing and saying, well, that's just the way I am, but I need to do a better job at that, and I need my team to help me do a better job by by figuratively punching me in the head when they see it. <laughs> you got you caught yourself yeah, that yes, time. Yes. Not literally punching you in the head. Don't want right. anyone Don't to misinterpret it. Yeah. <laughs> but, I'm fragile. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so leaders are found at the top, and leadership is determined by a title. Sure. Myth. Total myth. Leaders are found everywhere, and if you're, if I'm doing a good job as as the CEO of an organization, I'm constantly cultivating and training and giving opportunities for for experience building to everybody on the team. Everybody on the team is a leader, and at the same time, everybody on the team is a follower. I follow as much as I lead. I might have a have a more visible role in the organization by design um, and by necessity, but that doesn't make me any more important than anybody else in the organization. And I am failing if I'm not getting the best advice from the team, which means they have to be confident and comfortable giving me that advice. Uh, you know, the, a lot of these platitudes, you, know, you hear them all the time, but when you when you live them and you, you give them to your team and say, hold me accountable to these, it starts to have a real positive effect. But this notion that you know, the only only perk of, of, of ascension in terms of leadership in a hierarchical organizational chart is that you've got more people working for you, that's a fallacy that's illustrated by this. You're working for more people. Everybody on my team, I'm there to make their job easier, to help them make faster, smarter, stronger decisions. Period. That's all I'm there to do. I'm not there to make them have them make me look good. I'm not there to tell them what to do. I'm there to help make their decision making faster, stronger, and smarter. So you got to so awesome, awesome feedback there. You got to a managing director level at KPMG, right? Can you talk a little bit about because that is an iconic brand, and I think uh, you know you hear a lot about um, the hierarchical corporate structure. Sure. That, that may or may not exist there. And again, I'm asking you because I didn't, I didn't work for them, so sure. I'm not tr- trying to speak out of turn. But what did you learn from that experience in coming up through that uh, very corporate uh, uh, spot to sure. where you're at today? Sure, that's a great question. I, um, my time at KPMG was relatively short uh, until Larry and Fred interrupted me, which was a positive interruption. I was happy to have it. Um, but KPMG is a fantastic organization. I was on the, on the deal advisory consulting side. I can't speak to the accounting side. And every accountant that I work with here and everywhere else would be nodding their head right now saying, no, he's not going to talk about accounting. <laughs> I leave that to the accountants, um, as I should. But on the, on the deal advisory side, it was very corporate uh, in terms of the hierarchy and the expectations and timelines to promotion and compensation plans. And it was very scripted. We've got 70, when I left, it was 76,000 employees worldwide. You better be scripted or you're going to fall apart. There's no, there's no way around it. You've got too many people. At the same time, the teams that I worked on, my principal team and then the, our, our partner teams, were very um, uh, egalitarian. There was not a hierarchy of in terms of your, your title, your position in the organization. It was, I like to call it the upside-down pyramid, where the managing directors and the principals and the directors served the managers and the senior managers and the associates. That, that's the way it worked. So it was, uh, it was refreshing to see that kind of hyper-structured organization that had to be hyper-structured given the diffusion of the team. We were, we were never in our office. I was in my office exactly two times, the day I started and the day I left. That was it. Otherwise, I was never, ever, ever in my office. I was on an airplane and at a client site. Um, so you have to have, you have, to have uh, some controls in place. Right. You know, expense reports get filed or you don't get your paycheck. That's pretty good. That makes sure you get 100% compliance on your expense reports. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, I think the... The balance of having the, the hyper-focused structure and the, the rules and processes blended with an environment that expected the team to help develop itself and continue to win client contracts was, was unusually positive, I think, unexpectedly positive, I would say, from, from my experience. Coming into to Frank Productions, and again, I, I classify the company as a 55-year-old startup in a lot of ways. It's been around in different iterations for almost six decades based here in Madison. Um, and it's changed and evolved quite a bit. And it has been run by the family for the entire time. And so coming in and saying, we're going to go from a couple dozen people to a hundred people plus in a very short period of time required some sense of structure. And we had to put standard operating procedures in place. And we had to give people titles and we had job descriptions written up. So we had to do a lot of that core blocking and tackling of organizational setup, um, which came with a little bit of a, a little bit of a hiccup in terms of 
comfort and confidence. Sure. And, uh, it's changed. It's it changed. It was a lot, yeah. of, a lot of growth very fast. Um, but we now have a structure in place that is, that is relatively tight, but also very simple. Right? It's not as deep and complicated as a 76,000-person organization has to be. And I call them standard operating procedures because uh, I like to remind people they're not always operating procedures. You cannot do these things. You can, you can violate them. You just have to be able to explain why. Right? We're not going to conceive of every scenario in which you're going to react, interact with a client or a coworker or a vendor. So this is what we generally like you to do. But if you find yourself in a position where you have to not follow the SOP, that's fine. Just be able to explain it. And if you forget the SOP, that's okay too. Just don't do it again, right? It's, it's perfectly acceptable to make those mistakes. So we put a structure in place that, that I think people are generally comfortable with. And I've also indicated that this thing is going to change over and over and over again. We're going to constantly refine ourselves, not on a six-month basis or an annual basis, but whenever we need to. It's going to happen on a Tuesday in July. It's going to happen you know, the day before Thanksgiving when necessary. So building that comfort to uh, be on the balls of our feet as a team and expect iteration, and it, which also means that you should expect a uh, response when you file a complaint of some kind, when you lodge a, a criticism or you have something that needs to be fixed or that you'd like to see fixed, don't be surprised when it's addressed. Don't be surprised when we change something, right? We have, we've made a few acquisitions and mergers over the last couple of years, which means you're bolting together very distinct processes. Mm-hmm. And from an analytic perspective, I need one universal place for data to live. This is a, this is a real head scratcher for every organization. How do I let people do what they're, they've been successful at, but also change their processes enough so that I can get the information to help them make their decisions faster, stronger, and smarter? Well, that's a bit of a Rubik's Cube for me. So everyone wants uh, to use their own process, but everyone wants universal data. You can't have both. So we have to amend our processes and explain those amendments and, and get people to comply, and, and that's a constant, constant challenge. Yeah. And again, I, I've iterated many times on the show that change typically is good. It's the transition that people hate. Yeah. It's learning those new processes that you're trying to implement so that you get the information to be able to make a faster, better decision. Right. That, that transition is always the hardest part. I found one of the, one of the tricks, if you, can, if you can do it, if the timing lines up, is to change a process and then bring a bunch of new people in and onboard them with the new process. Then they and learn... Then just you've got you've got no learning curve, and you've got one or two people who are now catching up to the new kids. Yeah, right. And it it has a benefit of being being a little bit. It's cute. not a bad trick if you yeah. can do it. If if you're situated properly to yeah. do it, it works. Let's see. All right, let's get to another uh, myth. Uh, I started the company, organization, team, office, whatever it may be. Therefore, I have the right to lead it. Sure. Um, in some cases, that's true, right? Especially in smaller uh, startups or family operations, where where there's a there's one obvious choice for the initial period of time. Uh, I think as you enter into a circumstance where the growth has gone a direction that's different than the original conception, you need to continually evaluate um, the leadership structure and the leadership personalities of a team. And in, in the situation I'm in with uh, with the Franks, they they are activating a succession plan. So Herb and Sylvia Frank started the company and Larry and Fred took it on um, many years ago, decades ago. I won't call out how many, but <laughs> quite a while ago. And they're saying now, when they called me the first time on this, they said, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not looking to leave in 18 months, but we'd like, to, we'd like to have confidence that when we do start to dial back, that the ship's going to run well. And we're going to spend the time and effort now to organize ourselves and get everybody motivated and get everybody situated properly so that we can start actually succeeding and walking away from the 50, 60, 70 hour weeks and still have confidence. That is a very purposeful decision by them. That's a very hard thing to do um, for anybody, Mm -hmm. but especially somebody, uh, two brothers who have sat across a desk like this. This is how they work. They sit across a desk this close together. I don't know if you have brothers, but I have a brother. I have one in this office as well, and he's he does not sit across a desk. He's well down the hallway. Yes, it's a really it's a really special uh, attribute for Larry and Fred, but it necessarily creates tension as as any relationship at work. I say uh, any family family business at some level is dysfunctional. Sure. It could be a high level, low level. It could be high functioning, low functioning. There's some dysfunction with family. It has to be. 
there's just uh, there's an additional layer of of variables that come into play for decisions and outcomes and behaviors that and communication that other organizations don't suffer. Yep. It's a it's a it sounds uh, it sounds polite to have a family owned business, but the reality of that is it's harder than anything else in the terms of in terms of business relationships. Dynamics for sure. Yeah. yeah. There's all those emotions there that you don't necessarily have. And uh, there'll be times where I've had to have a maybe just a simple question I think it's boiled down to is because Jordan didn't start in this office. Okay. He started in a different office. And I, and I labeled a question or kind of put it to you, would you have said that or asked that to your former boss? Yeah. And sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes he has to think about, ah, probably not. Sure. And then we have that dialogue and it, and it ends up being fine and we work very well together. But it, it, there can be, I've seen all over the board how dysfunctional family businesses can be. And, uh, but on the other hand, the loyalty and the uh, desire to succeed, especially a family that, uh, you know, the brothers take over for the parents, like there's a desire for that business to succeed sometimes that, you know, someone that's not family might not have. Can't replace it, can't replicate it. You talk about a legacy. A 50, 60, 70 year old family business, that's a legacy. Yeah, for sure. Most do not make it that long. Uh, I want to talk through a myth that possibly came up there is one of the things I find really interesting about your background is how, I mean, this, this you know, wind, not a straight line that you came to, and you kept your ear to the ground. So it's really admirable throughout, and then all of a sudden the Franks come to you. And for whatever the sales pitch was or whatever the the idea was, you bought in sure. hook, line, and sinker. I think one of the myths out there is that, that I hear a lot is oh, you have to have a job on your resume for at least two years, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. I don't think there's any have-tos at all. I think that it's where is your passions and your talents align, and where can you find a role that those two things that you can make. So, the, I always heard the average for Gen X, which I'm a part of, uh, we switched jobs seven times. Okay. So I, I, I found my love and passion at stop number two. Now I hear for the millennials, it's about 15 times that they'll switch jobs on average. Sure. Which that means there's some that are switching 30 times. Sure. So it's just one of those things where I found really uh, interesting about your path and thought of that as you were speaking there is like you kept the, your ear to the ground. You didn't... Uh, you may have thought there was a straight line when you were in college, but quickly found that there was not, and you went from public service to a privately held company and found great success in. Is there anything you can speak to on that myth? Yeah, I th- that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, I think, um, I'm just thinking back about all my all my decisions. There's a couple of dirty words that we use as humans that, that aren't actually dirty when they're, when they're thought through. One of them is uh, opportunistic. And another is manipulate, right? Manipulation is the is the art of getting somebody to do something that you'd like them to do, and it can be that can be negative, but largely it's positive. Anybody who's got kids, it's all you spend your time trying to do. Well, but, I manipulate them right, all day long. I, I've convinced <laughs> myself that I manipulate them, but when I laid in bed at night, I, I realized they've just played me again, right, on everything. <laughs> so manipulation is that two way street. But the opportunistic piece is one that I that I zero in on because you know, what's the what's the what's the Quip, it's uh, there's no such thing as luck, there is only uh, preparation and opportunity, yeah, right. And I, I do believe that there, sure, there's some luck in life, of course, there's timing and alignment is everything. But, um, Larry and Fred weren't didn't put a job posting out and say, We'll see what comes in for some reason because they have terrible judgment and character, they decided they were going to call me, and and I knew that as an incredible, unique, rare opportunity as soon as we started talking about it. And who am I to say, uh, no thanks, I'd like to be a partner at KPMG, which is not a bad road to go, but I knew what that was going to look like. And I did not know what this was going to look like with Larry and Fred. And a lot of things have happened in the last two years and eight months that we didn't anticipate, but here we are. And we're, we're growing and we're winning and we're developing and we're learning all the time. So I know I made the right choice, hands down, uh, for me. But in order for me to make that choice, I had to be on the balls of my feet and ready to change and ready to move, not just in terms of careers and paths, but physically. And sometimes that's not feasible for folks, and I understand that. But I agree with that advice. You, you, 
if you get stuck in this notion that there's a path and I need to do this recipe in order to get to where I want to go, you may well get there, but it's also possible you're going to spend an awful lot of time in the interim wishing there was another route, wishing yeah. that you'd found another path. Yeah, because I think that uh, the vast majority of people on their deathbed talk about the regrets of stuff they sure. didn't do uh, versus the things they did do. I, I give that advice a lot to people. You've got two choices, whether, you know, buy that house, don't buy that house, move to the city, don't move to the city, take that job, buy that company, whatever. Which of the two decisions are you least likely to be upset about two years from now, right? Try it, it doesn't work. Don't try it and, you know, keep all your marbles. And everybody gets to make that decision, and it's not a criticism either way, but ask yourself that blunt question. Yeah. Which one am I least likely to be upset about? Yeah, forget all the stuff you've heard or read about this should be on my resume this long or whatever. No, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, I am, I am living proof that two things, good things happen to dumb people, and there is no linear path to, to success. Also, that self-deprecation can be endearing. <laughs> it, can. it happens to be true, though. <laughs> no, it does. <laughs> All right, so we're going to play the word association game, right? All right. Oh, no, before. I think you'll be able to answer this quickly. Favorite part of being CEO at Frank Productions? Uh, I would say uh, two things. First, standing at a show and watching as the fans start to come in and seeing the, the real elation. You are presenting them with an opportunity to do something that they may have dreamed about for months or years, and it's gonna happen today. That feeling is incredible. And just watching everything come together and watching your team hit all the marks in terms of, of buying a show and marketing a show and selling tickets to a show and getting people in the room and getting everything set up is, is a real feeling of immediate accomplishment. You've just, your team, I haven't done it, the team has just created this experience this, this experience for joy which is incredibly valuable in those individuals lives and the community's life i love that i also love these little epiphany moments with the team when and i've had it happen routinely where somebody will come to me and say you know you've been saying all these things to us for two years i get it now it's starting to make sense and here's how i'm going to apply it in the circumstance what do you think i love watching that coaching catch that's a lot of fun well repetition is the mother of learning that's right so well, I love what you said there because you can tell your energy and passion for everything coming together and I can picture you standing there in the room uh, watching as everyone files in and creates that fun entertainment venue for everyone yeah. to enjoy themselves and have a break from our work-life reality or from the kids at home right. that are trying to manipulate us. That's right. They're <laughs> succeeding at manipulating us. Yeah. Like I have a babysitter for the next couple hours. I get to focus on this fun environment. And, right. And that's great. All right, so the word association game. Okay. Rules again. You can uh, repeat with, or I should say, one word response to short phrase. Okay. And you can't repeat yourself. Okay? Good luck. So, huh? <laughs> I said I failed the first time I did it with Chad. I, I wanted to repeat myself. All right, so integrity. Can it be a hyphenated word? Sure. Must have. Money. Vehicle. Loyalty. Absolute. Power. Unimportant. Trust. Foundational. Confidence. Nice to have. <laughs> Happiness. Most important word you said today. Great. Family. Most important part of my life. I like how you changed that there. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't repeat yourself. Yeah. Good. And my two of my favorite words inspire. Daily. Impact. Huge. All right. So favorite book of all time or most uh, a recent read that you really enjoyed and want to share with the audience? I like, I like, I like history books. I like management books. I like case studies. Um, well, I didn't say topic. I know. I'm, I'm sick in the head by Judd Apatow. It's All a right. compilation of pieces of interviews he did with comedians over a long period of time. Fascinating book. Really insightful. You talk about self-deprecation, and you talk about humility and vulnerability. That's it. So sick in the head. It's a great book. I want to put that down. You know, I, I typically read leadership self-development yeah. yeah. books. Uh, so I have a huge library on that. But one that I did listen to recently, actually about a year or two ago, was Kevin Hart's autobiography. Yeah. And listening to him read it was just absolutely hilarious. The as voice. It was. So yeah, you yeah. Can tell that voice from anywhere. So I'm gonna mark that one down. That sounds good. I like that a lot. I, if from the leadership perspective, the two that I always go back to are the Happiness Advantage, 
um, by Sean Aker, which is this great blend of science and reality, science and human interaction. And then the one that Renee knows I talk about several times a day is Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Yep. Right, got to have it. Oh, that's great. And I, I love the matrix. Yeah, that, the, that, that is the four square is the easiest thing in the world to look at, and it's that aha moment. As soon as you see it, you think, okay, build relationships, be honest. I can do those two things. Yep, that's great advice. All right, so how can our audience get in touch with you or follow you? I have a very light social footprint because I'm not cool enough to have a heavy one, but I would I would say uh, follow the Sylvie, follow Frank Productions. We've got all the socials on all the different interwebs. <laughs> um, but I would get on there and follow those. And if, you, if you're in a pinch, just follow Renee Frank. Sounds good. All right. Also, please remember to leave a review for us on iTunes if you've been following the show. Let us know what you think. We'd love to uh, have anyone on the show that you think would be uh, influential in leadership topics, whatever it might be. Let us know who you want to hear from. Uh, and follow us on Instagram at Josh Kosnick. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.